see golf playing, a uh, golf playing Dresden. And uh, look at his watches and this, he's got some uh, remarkable things. Well, I made that uh, little introduction when we were on the train on our way to visit uh, Rolf Lang up in uh, Dresden. Actually, it's a little town outside of Dresden. And um, essentially what we did, we had been on vacation and had gone down the river, down the Danube from, um, where was it, Budapest down to Nuremberg. And so we were going to take the train from Nuremberg over to Dresden to uh, see Ralph Lang. There were a couple people uh, that we met with in addition to Ralph. One uh, was Dr. Freiderman Gieber from Leipzig, and the other was uh, John Mullen, who was uh, actually from, I think he probably had places in Switzerland and Barcelona and so forth. R very interesting guy, a uh, former um, banker. So anyhow, uh, th this story is, is a little difficult to tell because once we, we got to our destination, <laughs> I, got, I was so, just so jazzed by everything. I, my, the, I was trying to photograph everything and a stupid camera went from different modes and I, I I got as many pictures of my feet I think as I did the watches so bear with me on this one now the uh, we started off in Nuremberg at the train station and right away <laughs> something changed the uh, they said well your train's been canceled and we had reservations on a train from Nuremberg to Leipzig and then make a connection at Leipzig that went on to Dresden and on the way back and had another schedule. Well, they canceled the train, but they said, hey, there's, we're going to put you on this one. So we had reservations. And once we got there, the guy said, well, the reservations don't really work because <laughs> they were on the other train. So good luck. So that was pretty much how we got started. And I'll tell you, the, uh, we went from, the, from Bavaria sort of in a big fish hoop, a fish hook loop around um, the western part of Czech, uh, the Czech Republic. So we went through Bavaria, over the Bavarian Alps, uh, where we ran into some snow. It was part of the, the Alps. And um, it wasn't the, wasn't the really high part. It was high enough to have uh, fresh snow in the, in the middle of May, or actually, well, in, at the beginning of May. And then we went around to, uh, to Saxony and came into, uh, after after we did catch a train in, in Leipzig because they held it. <laughs> so, so that was, um, we just, as soon as we got on, they took off. And uh, and we were with a guy who was a, uh, from Japan, he was a rep for Seiko. And he, he, and, he and us, with three of us, sort of <laughs> had to scramble over through the, to get through onto the right track, then we went on and all got into Dresden. Um, once we got to Dresden, uh, we were met there by uh, Dr. Friedermann Gieber and um, Rolf Lang. And uh, we hopped in a car and drove up to this wonderful uh, place up in, it was in Saxony, of course, but it was outside of Dresden, this little town, and um, on top of a hill. Uh, so it was sort of, it was almost like going into a Swiss uh, chalet. And everything for the watch, except for a couple things, I forgot what they were, but they were not major parts. <laughs> they were made in this, in this house and workshop. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at it. Now, one of the things I found out in, in wondering, you know, why is it that these big companies that have lots of money and spend tons of money on advertising, they spend a lot of money on uh, you know, getting a celebrity to say their watch is good. Uh, you know, what's going on? How come they, why is it so difficult for them to create their own movement? Und dann fertige ich die Uhr. Ich mache eigentlich alles selber. He does everything by himself. 
Ich kann die, die Gestellteile selber machen, also die Basisteile. Ich mache Räder und Triebe selbst. Ich mache alle Schrauben selber. Zeiger selber. Also Hebelfedern mache ich auch selber. 97% of all the watches he does himself. Manufactures himself. Okay. Okay. All these tools are. Wie, wie alt sind die Maschinen? Weil ja, das ist eine Glashütte, in das Glashütte hergestellt. Hütte, ja. Das ist im Halbautomat, da kann man das Triebe fressen. Ist, ja. ist, ist das vor dem Krieg gemacht oder nach dem Krieg? Vor dem Krieg gemacht. Vor das ist ungefähr. Das mehr, bevor der, der der Neues 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 okay. you know what? Das ist Glashütte. What is this? Das ist Gold. Das ist Gold. Es ist mehr ein Thema, do it uh there they create one and then they have a lot of different versions of it is because of the mass production uh a while back i talked about some independence and there was this one chinese guy who just would put together these wonderful movements one after another but he didn't really do it with the eye that hey i you know how is this going to work with mass production how can i sort of modify it 50 ways from Sunday so that it can, you know, be another movement uh, with the same base. Well, the, the interesting thing about a true craftsman, and I'm not talking about a watchmaker, I'm not talking about a crowdfunded thing that somebody gets an idea and is putting together movements uh, that are already made with some interesting case designs but rather a, a a true craftsman and in going through this i hope to show some of the elements of that now having said that there were some some of the things we talking about I realized that not a lot of watch companies have have this and they talk about independence and so on and so forth that's really not to me isn't isn't that important i don't care you know if a company is owned by uh, a richemont or uh, or swatch or anybody else if they've got a craftsman there a, a, a watchmaker who's doing designs and making them that's what the important thing is and ironically these big companies that make a lot of watches they really don't have a whole lot of craftsmanship because they have to have their design for mass production. And the extent to which you have mass production, you're not going to have craftsmanship. I mean, that's not, not a criticism. That's just a reality of it. With some certain watchmakers, I think that uh, watchmakers like um, Jean-Marc Viderec, Definitely that. I, F. P. Jorn. I think that uh, Kerry Um There are some others who are that way. Uh, I've seen them. I've talked to them. And uh, Rolf Lang is another one. It's like the the difference though is that where most of them, such as um, F. P. Jorn such as Kerry Boutin and such as Michel Parmigiani, all of these guys have one thing in common, and that is, is that they worked as restorers at one time, or repairers. They did, uh, they, they did work with taking these old clocks and perhaps some old watches, pocket watches, wristwatches, whatever, and restoring them. They're, they did restoration. And uh, what came out of it is, is that if you look at s some of the most interesting kinds of things that have been done, it's be because it, this is the kind of thing that's going on, is that they have this incredible uh, skill. And, and uh, Ralph Lang, was, he didn't have a lot of choice for to some extent uh, because the uh, Saxony was part of the Soviet Union, part of... Um, East Germany, I don't know, wasn't only a part of the Soviet Union, but it was under the under the rulership of that. 
and uh, born into it in 1948. Uh, this was sort of the path that uh, he had. He couldn't take his, his dad was a, a watchmaker too, and um, but you couldn't because of the way that the that type of sort of more of a Stalinist mindset that you couldn't uh, have your parents. During the war, Dresden had been bombed very badly by the uh, British and the Americans, and this is like in 1945, very, very late in the war. And a lot of people thought it was unnecessary, the Germans had pretty well lost it and everything else. And uh, uh, Rolf Lang uh, made a memorial watch to that. It's called the Peace Watch, which is always a good idea. But interestingly, the bombing provided the opportunity for Rolf Lang to get into restoration. Uh, again, remember, this is under the, the uh, Soviet uh, uh, regime, uh, part of East Germany. And so instead of going into uh, the usual kind of route that a watchmaker takes, uh, and they have a, a restoration, a period when they're doing restoration, uh, F.P. Jorn, for example, worked in his uncle's uh, shop for years doing restoration. Kerry Boot and Lonnen actually uh, did the restoration for um, Parmigiani, and Parmigiani himself was doing restoration for the uh, Sandoz family when they said, hey, we'll have a have a watch company for you. So what you're going to find is you're going to find a lot of the really top watchmakers. In fact, I think just about every single one of them did some kind of restoration. Well, so did Rolf. Rolf, Rolf had a lot more of it because there was so much damage to the mechanical museum where Rolf did the restoration of, of all of these different uh, mechanical devices, uh, including watches and clocks. So, <laughs> in Remember, this is uh, his guy born in 1948. It wasn't until about 1990 that the, uh, the reunification came and everything changed, all right? But by then, Rolf was this extremely experienced uh, uh, a watchmaker beyond what most people uh, sort of use as an apprenticeship. Most of the grand masters do. Anyway, now, one of the more interesting things about uh, Rolf Lang in terms of his background, the guy that he credits more than anyone else is John Harrison. Um, it's not Breguet or some of the other ones, but it's Harrison. And Harrison is famous for discovering a way in which to make a chronometer to determine the longitudinal position. Uh, this was a big problem back in the old days. They had latitude figured out. I'm not sure how, but they did. And they needed a way to work, to have a chronometer or something that would tell you where you were in terms of the longitudinal position, which is essentially uh, east and west, and your uh, latitude is north and south. Uh, uh, he made a watch uh, in... Uh, for Harrison's uh, 325th birthday, <laughs> we could talk about a late birthday present. Anyway, the 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 watch that he made, I saw there, and it just it's it's called the Golden Age, and uh, the H, of course, is for Harrison. It's a beautiful. I mean, it's just unbelievable, really <laughs> beautiful watch. So here is. What I suppose is, is the important thing about uh, a watchmaker, like, you name them, any of the really top ones from Philippe Dufour, Roger Smith, Kerry Wooten Lonnen, uh, F.P. Jorn, and there's a whole other list of other ones. Um, oh, Christian Vanderclaw, he's another very <laughs> top, top one. So, but they're, each one of them had some kind of a set of experiences, and then they had a, a guiding star. Uh, F.P. Jorn was really sort of a double one. It was um, a, uh, George Daniels, as was uh, Roger Smith. 
But Daniel's, uh, one of his contributions that I think that F.P. Jorn was most influenced by was his book on Breguet. <laughs> so anyway, it's a, uh, and instead of one of the German watchmakers or a French watchmaker, it's an English watchmaker, John Harrison, that most influenced uh, Rolf Lang. So now what about us as collectors? Well, collectors, we, we have to do one of two things at some point, okay? Uh, craftsmen, when they make a watch from beginning to end, um, and you saw the, uh, the workshop that Rolf has, it's, I mean, it's got all the equipment to make everything you need in a watch, but you can't mass produce them. Uh, even some of the best, Patek Philippe, Rolex, all of these, these are all mass produced watches. And you don't have any idea who the watchmaker is. On the other hand, if you buy a watch by someone like, and pay a lot for it, but like uh, Kerry Wooten-Lannan or by um, uh, Laurent Ferrier, uh, F.P. Jorn, or any number of others, uh, really top-notch watchmakers, uh, they don't knock them out <laughs> you know, with a big machine that will produce thousands of watches a day. So, um, so how do, how, you know, what is the reality of this in terms of actually having one? Well, if you're, if you're looking for something under a thousand dollars, you may find it in a, you know, a junk store somewhere where somebody didn't know the value of it. But by and large, you're, you're not going to find one. And I don't think you're going to find one under, uh, I mean, uh, F.P. Jorn, I was advised that he's the best way to, to get into this level of, of horology because his, he had the best prices. <laughs> I mean, starting to use $20,000 is a, is a good price. Um, a little less for the uh, quartz uh, elegante, uh, perhaps, but so... But here, I think we're going to find, at least for now, I hope, a really good, exceptional horology for a good deal less. I'm hoping under $10,000. This I would really like to see. And I know that's a, an incredible amount of money. I mean, a thousand bucks for a watch is a lot of money. But if, if you want something, that is crafted, you, you have in your hand. I got on my uh, F.P. Jorn, and it's, it's the experience of the talent of the watchmaker. And uh, I think you can see this in Rolf Langs. I, I can feel it and see it and somehow experience it, <laughs> not even sure how, in my F.P. Jorn, and the uh, some of the other watches, you know, actually one is uh, Richard Harbring's Harbring Two Felix experience it in that. So anyway, well, listen, um, I'd love to hear your comments, what you think, uh, and your ideas, <laughs> and also, um, it, as always, this is a opportunity to subscribe if you like. And until next time, which is Sunday, when we have our collection review, this time we'll get it done for sure. Uh, this is Bill Sanders for Watch Art Sci, the art and science of watch collection.